is in our award winning and um, an extremely popular uh, series of guest lectures uh, in this both with what I hope were some fairly interesting lectures by me. Um, today's lecture is from Mark Nichols here, and it's about uh, war reporting and, and embedding uh, of journalists within uh, the communications teams of uh, the armed forces. Um, Mark worked for many years uh, for the Art Church newspapers in East Anglia, um, and now worked freelance, and um, has done many tours of duty uh, abroad uh, in places uh, such as Afghanistan. And he, um, he also specializes in travel writing, which I think is a quite an interesting little, little uh, uh, double act there. That, um, he, he travels to various places around the world, and sometimes their natives are hostile. That was your cue for a joke. Right? It was funny. Um, so he's going to talk. He went last year, didn't he? He went down. Oh, I went down. I had people laughing with that joke last year. I'm going to cut that bit. Okay. <laughs> right. Mark is going to talk to you then about uh, war reporting and any uh, ethical issues there might be with that. Um, you'll know that there is um, one of the essay types, one of the project titles, does touch upon, is about. War reporting, so this could be useful for any of you who are thinking of doing that question. No further rubbish from me. Here's Mark. Morning, all. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about war reporting, uh, but war reporting pretty much from the uh, embedded correspondent perspective, and look at some of the uh, challenges and ethical issues and integrate um, sort of day to day journalist practice within that. So, uh, <coughs> effectively, you know, the title of the talk poses a question. Embedding, whether it's military censorship or an unrivaled journalistic opportunity. So, uh, looking at um, the background to embedding, uh, is embedding something new? Well, sort of yes and no, really. Uh, journalists have always accompanied armies to, to war, sometimes officially, sometimes not. You know, the chroniclers were there at Agincourt in the Middle Ages, the Crimea, the Boer War. There were journalists at World War One and World War Two, Vietnam, Falklands, Korea, and in Gulf War One. Now, what I want to talk about is embeds as opposed to unilaterals. So, unilaterals operating <coughs> courageously, independently. Uh, often with uh, probably more, finding more of a humanitarian than a military angle, uh, and with a different agenda and a different brief. They're the unilaterals. I've often been uh, embedded with military units. I can stop there for a second. I've got a feeling that some of them might not know that what, what we mean by those two things. So embedding is when the, um, the journalist works within certain con strengths with, within the, you yeah. don't talk about this in great, yes, with, yeah. with, with, the, with the armed forces, a unilateral is somebody who covers um, an armed conflict off their own bat, and, and there are kind of, there are pros and cons to that position. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I stopped you. Yeah. So, so the, the, the two, two different elements, and uh, you know, hopefully I'll sort of draw different aspects of those together as, as we continue really. But mass embedding, as we, probably know it today, was first used in Iraq, in, in uh, the Iraq War 2003. Uh, it was something like 700 correspondents were embedded with military units across uh, the Middle East during the, the, the course of that conflict. Now, embedding is <laughs> an easy target for critics. Uh, people see, oh, journalists working closely with the military, not much scope for uh, freedom, that there's, it's all about propaganda, it's all controlled. Now, actually, the thing is, what that says to me is that those critics do not understand how journalists work. It's, it, it, that they, they haven't got an idea of the day-to-day -day journalistic practice and the mindset of a journalist. So, but it's an easy target for critics. What we also need to uh, remember is that media pressure was a factor in the sort of modern concept of embedding, that uh, 
the media outlets were getting more and more concerned that there was a lack of access during the Gulf War of 1991 and during the early stages of the Afghanistan conflict. It is also an inevitable response to the modern era, particularly in Afghanistan where, uh, and, and places like Syria where Western correspondents are vulnerable to attack, to kidnap, to, to basically execution. So, just about my embedded experience, um, Eastern Turkey in 2001, uh, when the, uh, the RF was uh, involved in the no-fly zones over northern Iraq, the last sort of uh, parts of the, the Gulf War I, Kabul 2002 uh, in Kuwait, Kuwait and Iraq in the War of 2003, uh, I went back to Basra a year on 2004, I've been in the Persian Gulf, and more recently, um, Helmand in 2007 with the British Army, and Kandahar in 2014. So, how does embedding work? Uh, well, first of all, this is a photograph. This, this was taken on what you could call Sangin High Street. Anybody, does the name Sangin mean anything to anybody? It's a, it's a town in, uh, in northern Helmand in, in that, that, that province of Afghanistan. I think that uh, the British military lost about 450 personnel uh, during the, the Afghan conflict. About 100 of them were lives were lost in and around Sangin. And uh, the, the, the sort of British military took Sangin back from the Taliban. It looks like the Taliban is now about to take Sangin back, really. Uh, this is Sangin High Street. It was the, the B186. It's the road to Kajapi. At one stage, it was the most dangerous stretch of road on earth with uh, roadside bombs and ambushes and things like that. And this is a, a, a soldier of the Royal Anglian Regiment on patrol in Sangin High Street. So, looking at how embedding works, it's a pretty simple concept, really, that a journalist is transported to an airbase, uh, a war zone, a battlefield, lives, works alongside the military, and sees every aspect of what they do and how they perform. <coughs> the military feed, transport, brief, even manage the journalist, and that's where the interpretation gets a little bit edgy. Uh, journalists are supposedly given free reign to see all aspects of military life. The military will say, yes, it's for the correspondent to see how it is, but sometimes the military will put their own interpretation on that. It's that they can keep an eye on the correspondent. There are certain rules to follow. Uh, they're uh, encased in the Green Book, which is an MOD document. And it's, it covers issues such as how the media should behave and the military when they're working in close contact. Some of it's common sense. Some of it covers operational security. Other areas are a little more flexible. You're not supposed to name pilots or identify them, but if a pilot says, hey, my name's Wing Commander Derek Watson, you can talk to me and photograph me, he sort of wave, waves his right there. So that's how it works. Uh, there's different interpretations of it. If it's a nice, cosy relationship, it's not really working that well. I find that most of the embed experiences that I've been, there's a real edginess between the relationship between the journalists and the military. That's healthy, that feels good. It may not feel comfortable, but that's the way it should be, really. So, how can a correspondent make embed embedding work? Well, the simple stuff is do your homework. Now, I'm talking about war reporting and embedding, but the thing is, people have this view that, you know, ordinary reporting is over here, war reporting is over here. It's not, it is all basic reporting. And it's about do your homework, really. It's about get to know the, 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 the units that you're working with in the same way that if you was a, a crime correspondent or an education correspondent, and I'll come on to that, you'll form relationships, really. It's professional relationships. It's about what we do as journalists. But when I say do your homework, if you're embedded with the RAF, you make sure that you know the difference between a Tornado GR4 and a Tornado F3. Now, I may sound a bit like a plane spotter there, but actually I'll illustrate the importance of that as we go along. The better equipped you are, the, m the more knowledge you have, the, the basically, the better access you'll have to stories. You'll have better respect from the people that you're working with, but also, 
they'll look at you and think, hey, you know what you're talking about. You know your stuff. You're less likely to be hoodwinked. But also have a maturity to your approach in reporting. You know, if we look at serious, factual, accurate reporting analysis, and, and the thing is, the military, they would be happy if you did what they call hometown boy stories, that you know, if you went there and wrote about Corporal Billy Smith, who, who's a great cook and serves great food, his mother might be really pleased to see that article, the rest of your audience will quickly get bored with it. But also, use your experience, and what I mean there is use your experience as a journalist as it builds up, but also use your experience of life. Because you're working in a military environment. Now, you've gone into the military domain, but what you can bring to that is the outside world. A lot of the guys that you're working with, they are, you know, they are in the military, and that's all they know, and that's what all they see. You've travelled further, you've seen different aspects of the world, and also, look beyond the one-dimensional briefings that they give you. For example, uh, I remember when we we and a, a group of journalists were embedded with uh, the military just before the Iraq war. We were taken on a tour of Kuwait City by a flight lieutenant who told us how we should behave in an Islamic country in a Muslim environment. And we had this sort of two hour tour and this briefing and he thought it was quite interesting but didn't learn nothing that we hadn't already seen. And we were correspondents who had travelled extensively across the Middle East, so we knew what it was like in various Islamic countries. And at the end of it, we said, oh, OK, that was OK. Um, how many Islamic countries have you been to? And he said, oh, oh, this is the first, but, you know, I, I, I'm getting to know my way around. And actually, you realise that you are better informed. Uh, the other thing is, form relationships. Get to know the guys that you're working with, and they'll get to know you. But keep it a professional relationship, but there are interesting ways of doing that. You can get flying things like this, and it may sound great that you're flying in a tornado, but actually when you're writing about it, you know exactly what the, 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 the confines of a cockpit are, the way these guys are operating. So it is, you know, the more you know about them, the better that you can write about them. So, Let's have a look at the advantages of embedding. Now, <coughs> you get access to great stories, you're close to the drama, there's a cost benefit, relevant to a target audience, there's protection and security as well. So, <coughs> it means that uh, you, know, you, you, you get to, you, you're face to face with the people that you're talking to, you're not going through an MOD press officer, you can ask the question. And it's the classic case in journalism, if you don't ask the question, you won't get an answer. You're there when things happen. The cost point of view, you know, we all know how tough it is for the, particularly the regional press nowadays, that uh, to actually be a correspondent and get out to these places is, is often prohibitive, so that there's an advantage there. But also it's relevant to a target audience. Now, I worked in East Anglia where the RAF tornadoes were based. <coughs> Norfolk is a strong military county. There's lots of people there who are interested. So it is directly relevant to your target audience. It's what they want to know about. It's what they want to read about. You get the protection, you get the security. Uh, now, that's a double-edged sword as well, because you're probably wearing the, the dark blues of the, the, the media pool, so you're instantly identifiable. There was a time that that was, you were a neutral zone, uh, that uh, you know, conflicting sides would respect the independence of the media. Uh, that, that really has gone by the by, that you're very much a vulnerable target. Also, if you're riding in a, a military vehicle and it goes over a landmine, you've got about as much protection as the, the, the soldiers sat next to you. The other thing is you're part of the news pool. Now the thing is that's all information is shared, there's no exclusives. It means that you probably won't miss anything, but it means that you might not get anything extra special, unless you're one step ahead of the rest of the people in the, the, the embed, that you know your stuff, you're asking the right questions, and you're getting different answers. <coughs> So just going back to this access to information, 
people assume that if you're embedded, you know, you're only going to get what they tell you. Well, actually, you might get what you ask for. Now, th this is a story from um, uh, 2007 uh, with the Royal Anglian Regiment embedded in Helmand Province. At the time, the military would give details of soldiers killed in action. If you were to ask, well, what about other casualties? We have talked about that. Now, I'm not saying that this story was the story that changed it, but it was a, a time that there was a, a, a step change in, in the information on casualties. <coughs> and actually, rather than ringing up the MOD and asking for these figures and they say, no, we don't discuss that, you can talk to senior officers within a unit and ask them specific questions. They might say, we don't talk about it, or they might say, yeah, we're happy to talk. What emerged here was that um, this was the 1st Battalion of the Royal Anglian Regiment, so 600 men. And, I, I, and it was a really quite an intense talk. Nine soldiers died on that tour. But actually, I said, well, how many have suffered injuries? And these injuries ranged from broken bones and severe cuts through to life-changing injuries. And it emerged, they told me, quite happily, one in five of every soldier, 20%. So they are actually talking about the, the, the real cost of, of, uh, in terms of injury and, and life-changing injuries that soldiers are suffering. Information you would not have get, got if you wasn't there and wasn't asking the question. <coughs> so you're at the heart of the story. You see a key part of the action. You're present when things happen, so you get instant accounts. But the thing is, you're also present when it goes wrong. There's no hiding place for the military. Now, as well as that, you can comment, you can observe, and you can witness. Now, sometimes you're not being given information, but we all talk about our modern journalistic tools. You know, we've moved on, we've still got pens and papers, but we've got cameras, we've got tape recorders, we've got video, we've got all kinds of information, uh, information gathering tools. What we tend to overlook is our very precious, our very special personal information gathering tools. You know, our eyes, our ears, our sense of smell, our touch, our taste, all of these things you can draw upon to add you know, uh, an extra dimension to your story and you should use them in this kind of scenario when you're not getting what you want and I talk about smell and hearing and taste you know, if you're on a military base you can taste the aviation fuel in the air <coughs> it's this kind of detail but there's a more practical element so uh, I, I want to um, <coughs> uh, mention um, a little bit about seeing a, a, a key part of the action. So, this is on the very first night of you know, the bombing in the Iraq War of 2003. It's about how you get close to what's happening and relevant eyewitness accounts. This is our guy, Wing Commander Derek Watson, who you know, is a gift if you're embedded, because he talks to you, he tells you what's going on, and he's quite happy to talk to you. This was at about midnight when he led the first wave of British tornado jets to bomb Baghdad. I spoke to him just before he got into his cockpit. Two hours later, <coughs> after he landed, he opened his cockpit, a quick debrief to his ground, ground crew, and then sat down and we had a 15 minute interview. He told me exactly what he had seen over Baghdad. Eyewitness accounts, the whole of Baghdad was a light, explosions every few seconds, this gave me a story that I could sit and write at 3 a.m. local time, file back to Norfolk in time to hit the 1 a.m. edition and then update to a 3 a.m. edition. That is information in real time that you just would not get anywhere else. Now, <coughs> talking about using uh, the information that is accessible to you, you don't always get that kind of access straight away. Uh, Anybody know this phrase, I counted them all out? Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. It's a famous phrase from Brian Hanrahan, the 
BBC correspondent in the Falklands conflict. He was on a, a British aircraft carrier when the uh, Harrier aircraft were bombing Argentinian targets. He wasn't given any access to any information at all. But he used his senses, he used his common sense, and he formed a story. He counted every aircraft out, and he counted everyone back. He didn't know where they'd been, what they'd been doing, but he knew that no British aircraft had been lost. And remember, this was at a time that Argentinians were sinking British battleships you know, in the, in the South Atlantic. So, <coughs> but does the Hanrahan moment have a relevance today? Well, yeah, absolutely. We saw a classic example of that uh, in December last year with Jonathan Beale, the BBC correspondent. It was the night that the British Parliament had given approval for uh, tornadoes to carry out raids over Syria. He was in Abrakiri. He would have got a full briefing, but actually further down the line. So what he used was what he could see. And what he saw was that uh, he saw two tornadoes taking off. Because he had done his own work, because he knew what he was talking about, he could see that they were carrying <coughs> paved way bombs. Anyway, he watched these aircraft take off. An hour, uh, three hours later, he saw them land, and he saw them land without their weapons. What he could deduce from that was that they'd been on a specified mission, and that actually they had fired weapons at their, their targets. Not too much detail, but you know, if you're a correspondent, you've got a demand for a story, at least you've got some information. <coughs> so, I talked about um, how you're also there when it goes wrong. Uh, in the Iraq War of 2003, it went badly wrong for the British tornadoes, that there was an expectation there may be casualties, Nobody expected the Americans to shoot down a British jet. So what happened here was, and because we, had, uh, we were knowledgeable, we'd formed relationships, we'd got a good working relationship with the, the British senior officers, when this happened, you know, we were fairly well placed to get information. I mean, what happened first of all was that uh, you know, there was some confusion by the the middle ranking officers who were uh, escorting us and they shut us in a room and thought what we're going to do with these guys but fairly quickly the senior officers said come on let's talk to them bring them out and actually they told us all about what had happened about how it was a US Patriot missile that had um, fire, uh, shot down this British jet the next day the British military commander RF commander went to speak to the American missile commander had a full conversation, came back and relayed that conversation to us about you know, how those genuine tears and apology from the Americans and real-time information about what had happened. It didn't take days to come out, it didn't come out piecemeal, it was a full account of what happened. But the thing is, then, there was another little quirk to it that our friend Derek Watson, uh, he had led the four British tornadoes out on that mission and he was leading them back in. And he could talk to me about what he saw that night. You know, very vivid description. So, he tells me that they're flying back to the base, he saw, sees a flash in the sky, he fly, fires, fires chaff to deflect the missile, sees it explode behind him, thinks everything's okay, lands on the ground. Now, bearing in mind that the aircraft, the, the sky is full of aircraft, this is confusion of war, things aren't clear very well. On the ground, says, right, have we got four tornadoes on the ground? Yes, no problem. Anyway, they go back to the crew room, and a few minutes later, a young air traffic controller comes in and says, where is the fifth aircraft? And they're saying, what are you talking about? They're saying, we should have five aircraft. And they say, no, four tornadoes took off. Four, we've got four tornadoes on the ground. And she's saying, no, no, we need five on the ground. And they say, we don't understand what you're talking about. Then emerges that, yeah, four tornado GR4s took off. What landed 
with three Tornado GL4s and one Tornado F3 making an emergency landing with engine trouble. And, and they're sort of saying, well, okay, one of our aircraft is missing and it only then emerged, started to emerge, that one of them had been shot down. Just to confirm it, they drove over to the, the hangar where this aircraft should have been, an empty hangar, two ground crew sat on a crate waiting for the aircraft to come back. And then the picture started to emerge about how you know this aircraft was missing. And it's a quirky little twist to it, but it's stuff that comes out in real time because you are there and you are asking the questions. Now, having talked about all the positive <coughs> aspects of what you can get out of being embedded, there's one critical element, and this is you know, probably the most important aspect. That when you're embedded, you are just one aspect of the story. That conflict is covered from many angles. That you know, there's the unilaterals on the ground, there's the political angle, there's the cultural angle, there's the military <coughs> angle, and then there's all the stuff coming in now on social media. The thing is, I talked earlier about ordinary reporting over here, war reporting over here. It's not. They're the same thing. If there was a train crash in Sunderland or Newcastle this morning, yeah, the, the news editor of the Sunderland <coughs> would send out a team of reporters to the scene, to the hospital, you'd have people talking to the police, you'd have eyewitnesses, they'd be monitoring social media. They would bring it all together and build a big picture. War reporting is no different. As the embed, you are not the story, you're just one element of the story. And that's an important aspect to remember. <coughs> that um, w was summed up really concisely by a guy called Stephen Lee Myers from the New York Times. And he said the problem with embedding, if any, belongs to reporters, those who lose their objectivity and cheer, those who accept what the military says without a necessary dose of scepticism, those who presume <coughs> what they write is the all-encompassing truth <coughs> and not just one slice of it. That's what you are. You're one slice of the big picture. It's your editors who must assemble that big, big picture, whether it's your news editor or the TV production editors. <coughs> so, <coughs> what are the disadvantages well, the problem is you're tied to military schedules. You, you, you move when they say you can move. Even if you're on an airbase, uh, these airbases are massive, so you need escorting from one side to the other. So your access can be restricted. <coughs> it may not appear to be directly restricted, but if you need to get from one side to the other, they won't say, we're not taking you, we don't want you to speak to that person. They'll just say, the escort vehicle has broken down and you, it's been reallocated. So there are those kind of problems to overcome. <coughs> you also are the whims of commanding officers. Now the thing is, there are stories from the Iraq War of 2003 where correspondents got absolutely nothing out of it. That might have been for a variety of reasons. It might have been because there was no story. Not every unit was actively deployed. It might have been <coughs> that they hadn't really done their homework and formed relationships and given themselves the best opportunity to get stories. <coughs> or it could have been that they had gotten themselves in with a, a unit where the commanding officer was pretty anti-media, anti saw the embed as, uh, as a burden and wasn't going to be cooperative. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's all of these things that can actually derail the embed. Now you can do more to try and help it run smoothly if you're knowledgeable, informed, proactive, but if they don't want you there and they're not gonna cooperate, then it ain't gonna happen really. But also there's the dangers of being in a war zone. There's also the risk of censorship. Do they want to look at your text? Well, Quite a few of them might want to glance at it. Sometimes they don't. Uh, personally, I've had my text looked at. I've never really had it changed. I've had, I don't like that story. I'd rather you didn't send it out. 
but it is a true story, it's accurate, your decision. I have had one or two guys saying, I'm a bit uncomfortable about this line in your text. And when that happens, you say, okay, why are you uncomfortable about it? And if he gives a really good reason, then you think, okay, I see what you're saying. The particular line in the text is, probably I've gone a little bit into too much detail about specific wounds or things like that. <coughs> and this is the thing, that when you're in this context, you never should never lose sight of what's happening back home, because you're writing for a website or a newspaper that is going to land on somebody's breakfast table. Now, the thing is, you, you've got to sort of think, okay, you've got to be fair, you've got to be accurate, but are you being gratuitous in your use of uh, imagery or things like that? Uh, are you going to turn off your reader? Is it really necessary? This one line, the guy pointed it out, and I said, yeah, I see exactly what you mean. Didn't change the story or anything like that. It just t took a little more of the uh, superfluous information out of it. There is always the risk of censorship, but it'll be more discreet, more subtle, rather than obstructive. But personally, I've not had too much of an issue with that. There is also the risk that you could go native, and by that, <coughs> it's, I'm with the army, I'm going to be a soldier. You, re you must never lose sight of who your audience is, where your loyalty is, and, and retain your credibility and your impartiality. Talking about the dangers, um, this was in the Iraq War of 2003, taken in an air raid shelter. Uh, this isn't mocked up or anything like that. It was at a time that we, there was concerns that Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons and it was basically full chemical suits and uh, gas masks. Um, this is in um, Sangin High Street with an interpreter talking to local people. <coughs> I don't know who's got suicide vest on or anything like that. There is always that risk and there's that vulnerability. But there are also lots of other opportunities from embedding. You know, cultural features, analysis, informed reporting. You can be on the spot at the critical moments. <coughs> this one came out of Kabul in 2002. It was, uh, again, with the Royal Anglians, but we had the opportunity to go to Kabul University and interview women. Women who had not been uh, given access to information for five or six years while the Taliban were in, t in, in power. Uh, and this was basically, um, you know, just a few weeks after the Taliban had left town. You know, vivid accounts of what it was like to go back to education, but also why some of the women still wear the burqa. They didn't know who the Taliban were, and they didn't know when they would be back. Quirky little story here. Um, this is a story for the Eastern Daily Press in a military county where there is that kind of interest. Um, I have a colleague, or I had a colleague, um, who was a real military story, and he wasn't worried about war reporting, but he was interested in the military history. He gave me that print, top right, and that this is in Kabul. It's uh, it's a place called the Bala Hissar, which is a, a famous fortress, a famous landmark in Kabul. Uh, the top right print is of a regiment called the Ninth of Foot in about 1830. <coughs> now the Ninth of Foot became the Norfolk Regiment, became the Royal Norfolk Regiment, became the Royal Anglian Regiment. The main picture is the Royal Anglian Regiment on patrol outside the Bala Hissar. It's the same image with the same unit with the same ancestry, just divided by 150 or so years. And it means that you can tell the story about uh, you know, the, the Afghan conflicts, about the military history. What it does is that if you are sent on an embed, you can do the basics. But if you go that extra mile and you come back with several other features, your news editor's going to say to you, oh, you did a good job there, you made it worthwhile, we'll send you again. But also, there's always a different angle. There's a lot of waiting around on embed, so actually sometimes if you've got something to do, it helps. Uh, this was uh, 2007, on patrol in the green zone around Sangin, but it's on the, 9th, uh, on the 11th of September, a significant day, high level of risk, high level of threat. <coughs> We get a chance to interact with the opportunity. This is talking to people on the outskirts of Basra one year on after the end of the war. 
And also here, 2014, this is uh, when there was the, the sort of major wind down of uh, how you basically dismantle a base like Camp Bastion, which is the size of a small city, and, and um, you yeah, know, the logistics involved in dismantling it. So, the other thing is, is truth a casualty of war? It's a, a phrase that often arises when we talk about embedding. Uh, personally, it's a bit of a cliche. It's uh, a nice little sound bite. It's trotted out sort of thing. But as I've pointed out before, the military, they can't hide bad news. You're there, you can see, you can hear, you can feel, you can experience. Also, your experience and your instinct can override any doubts that you have. Now, um, there's a, 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 a correspondent, um, Patrick Coburn from The Independent, who, uh, you know, he summed this up. Now, what he actually said, he, he operated as a unilateral. Now, he used to say, I used to get a certain amount of undeserved applause at book festivals by being introduced as a writer who has never been embedded. Now, yeah, I've got a vision of who this audience is giving him this applause, and I don't have much time for it. Yeah, because basically, they're the people who criticise embedding uh, and have no idea about any of the journalistic practice that I've been talking about. If I was to be flippant, I could say, well, Coburn, you, you, you've no experience of one aspect of covering a conflict. You know, as I said, we're just one slice of the big story. <coughs> but what he goes on to say, he says, embedding obviously leads to bias. You know, I just have a little question mark over that word obviously, because, you know, as journalists, we've got integrity. We have this sixth sense. We know when we're uncomfortable with, with the story. But he continues, but many journalists are smart enough, that's you lot, to rumble military propaganda and wishful thinking and not to regurgitate these in undiluted form. It puts a huge amount of responsibility on our independence, our integrity, our credibility, our impartiality as embeds. And, and we need to take that burden with us when we go to an embed. <coughs> Embedding, right? You know, we're there with the military. I think that this quote from Marjorie Miller from the Los Angeles Times sums it up very neatly. You know, we didn't want to be in bed with the military, but we certainly wanted to be there. We wanted to be there, we wanted to see, experience, we wanted access to the kind of information that we were getting from uh, an embed placement. So what's changed within the concept of embedding over the last decade? It was harder to get a place on an embed. The obvious reason is that the British military is not so active in Afghanistan or Iraq as it as it was in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10. Is that going to change? Well, you know, if you asked me three years ago, would the British military be dropping bombs over Iraq? I'd say no chance. You know, would they be dropping bombs over Syria? No, I don't think so. So we never know what's going to happen. There is an element of increased operational security. And uh, this was taken, this is the back end of a tornado, a picture I took at Kandahar Air Base in September 2014. The military are more likely to want to look at your images as opposed to your text. You know, if I'd taken this in 2003 with a, a you know, a, a, a stills camera, the amount of detail would not have been, you know, it wouldn't have been that easy to magnify. With digital imagery, yeah, there's the potential with the right sort of camera to actually see what's in those hangers behind, and they're very sensitive about that, uh, particularly on a base where you've got, you know, American Special Forces, they get really twitchy about those sort of things. But also, there's lots more hoops to jump through, you know, before you could just go and join units, now you need to go to medicals, get visas, get accreditation, uh, but it's still very worthwhile. So, does embedding work? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask me, yeah, I think it can work. It's a good way of covering a conflict. Uh, uh, what do the media think? Well, you know, if you ask some of the people who are embedded in the Iraq War of 2003 and got nothing out of it, they'd say, no, complete waste of time. What do the military think? Well, you know, you've got pro and anti sort of 
elements within the military that you know some of them think yeah he, he has really raised the profile and certainly it's a chicken and egg scenario the British public is more behind the military now than it was 10-15 years ago now is that because of embedding or is embedding a response to that demand from the public the critics view it still remains this one dimensional that embedding is really not a good way of covering war what you've got to remember though is if you're a unilateral on the ground with for example a Taliban unit or a Syrian army unit or something are you going to get any more freedom of movement are they going to show you anything with more impartiality than you'd see with the British military I think probably not they're only going to show you what they want you to see and that's why <coughs> we all come together as the big picture so how do you make it work the key is how you as a journalist use your experience instinct and skill to make embedding work so in conclusion yeah, it's not the only way to cover a war but it is a realistic way of covering one aspect of a conflict and so in answer to the question is embedding a way for the military to control and censor the media or is it an unrivaled journalistic opportunity my view is that's not only for you to decide but you can also have the power to define the answer to that question by your behaviour as an embed. So, I'm happy to take any questions that any of you may have on that. Yes, um, when you're uh, out in the various countries that you might be covering, and is, is it quite difficult to speak to, say, civilians who might be kind of in and around the area because there's language barrier or maybe they don't want you, the military might not want you to speak to them? Uh, you've sort of covered a lot of aspects in that question and they're all there really. That um, Sometimes the military might not want you to speak, they won't tell you that. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to get to them. But equally, when you do get to them, as in that scene with the interpreter in Sangin High Street, You've really got to take a lot of caution because you're asking a question to an interpreter who's talking to people in the village. They're giving you an answer. It's filtered back through the interpreter. There's a lot of scope for it to go wrong. Are the villagers telling you what they really believe? Or is there somebody in the crowd who's a, you know, a Taliban informant? Does the interpreter have his own agenda? Uh, and so it's fraught with difficulty. I think that realistically, yes, sometimes you can get to talk to people and you have your journalistic sense when you feel as though somebody is he's not quite telling you what they want to tell you. Uh, generally, when I've spoken to people in this context, uh, I've got quotes from them, but you need to couch it that it's come through an interpreter and give some indication of the scenario it's from. Oh, it's good for colour, it's good for information. Um, Certainly, the Kabul University, you were talking to educated women who were talking to you independently and giving you a very honest and actually a very courageous view because some of them didn't know when the Taliban were coming back. But it's a good question, and you need to have all of those warning lights on when you actually take, take the answer to it. Can I ask a question, Mark? Um, I have some PR students here. Um, is, is it, uh, how's it work? Job opportunities for PR people to work in military comms. I mean, how does it work? Are they are they are they from military who um, uh, have a, uh, a skill or have some training in PR or comms, or are these are comms people who are like you guys just wearing a uniform? Um, well, th there's the whole range, really. Mm. Certainly um, during the Iraq War of 2003, because there were so many embed units, they were. They, they needed sort of military comms people or people who had been on a often just a two week course um, to, to act as minders for the military what they were bringing in was a lot of um, outside PR people who were RF reservists who um, so that's a good way if you're in PR but you're interested in this you know the RF reservist comms team there's lots of opportunities within that and actually they were bringing in guys who um, 
Yeah. They've got this out, outside world view, so that while there's tension within between the journalists and the, the military at times, there was tension between the, the, the PR unit, because there's the outside PR guy who, who knew how to handle stories, and the military who were you know mid-ranking officers and they're, they're the the twitchiest of all really uh, who who were very very cautious. Um, how you overcome this as a journalist, uh, you know, that you have good uh, you know good relationships with the guys above that. But um, but uh, yeah, there, there are opportunities within this respect really. So, what's another aspect to your question? That was it really. Yeah. Just, just wanted to know how you kind of answer it. What are the opportunities and B, how does it work? I couldn't quite, you know, I've not done this kind of reporting myself. I couldn't quite figure out how it would work. You know, all, all, the, all these people, PR people who, any advantage that they're, yeah. they're quite often reserved to have brought into big companies, yeah. or they're actually middle ranking military people in the first instance. Yeah, who are often sort of thrown in, told they're doing this. Yes. Now, the thing is, they will have story ideas for you, and they'll be very safe the hometown boy kind of story. Yeah. This is where you need to be informed, so as you can say, actually, I want to talk to so-and-so about this story and tease the angle out of it, and, and you know, they'll, they'll react in one of two ways. They think, oh, I don't know anything about that. Oh, you can't talk about that. Or they'll just say, oh, yeah, yeah, just go and, go and do it sort of thing. But, yeah, the better armed you are, the better equipped with knowledge, uh, the better opportunities you will have. On the other side, the coin is clearly very useful, I think, students to do a course like this, which is part of the other part of journalism, so they can see how journalism ethics and how it works and how journalists work. There you go. I thought I'd just put in that plug for Med, <laughs> Med 312, Media Ethics. Yeah, we played your topic earlier. Have you ever taken a photo that could be distressing for public if it was to be published? Sorry, say that again. Have you ever taken a photo that could be distressing for public if it was to be published? And do you think people need to see some kind of, I don't know, some okay, I, I, that are going in there? I've probably taken photographs that might have been distressing. You might not think that they were distressing at the time, but uh, I haven't taken photographs of you know, seriously injured guys or things like that. Um, but uh, it comes back to what I was saying before, that you need to remember what is appearing, what is landing on a breakfast. Uh, that, um, but it's this thing about images that um, uh, what is distressing for one person is the truth to another, really. And uh, a classic image is the, the, the help for heroes, you, you know, the, the, the charity, and it's got that image of the guys carrying the stretcher against the, the sunset. Do, does, is that a familiar image? Yeah. You know, the, the military, uh, the, the guys around it, don't take pictures, don't take pictures, this guy's injured. And actually the guy on the stretcher was saying, yeah, take my picture, it's okay. And, and you know, the, the, the guy took the picture and that became one of the great war images, really. And it's been, it, it is the instantly recognisable image of help for heroes. So I, the, the thing is, it's the same, and not just in, germ, in war reporting, but any kind of reporting. My view is, Take the picture and then, you know, make the decision afterwards. Don't don't sort of think I'm going to take this picture or I'm not going to take this picture because actually you will regret that making that decision in the instant. Take it and then, you know, for want of a better word, self censor sort of thing. And, and and it depends who you're writing for. You know, what will appear in in newspapers in say Asia or Africa is quite different to what say the British newspaper or the British mm. TV news or website reader will, will find acceptable. So, so and yeah, the short answer is I don't think I've ever taken pictures that um, I thought were um, you know would, would cause offence. I've, I've <coughs> taken pictures that I've looked later at and thought. That's not really quite the right image, sort of thing. It gives it too too much detail. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of one image in particular of uh, you know, some children who were brought in, who were caught in a crossfire. And it wasn't a case of their imagery, but it was just their vulnerability, really. Thank you. And that was very useful because we, we looked at imagery last week, and that whole thing. So he was working yeah. on that question, perhaps. We did look, look at the differences between. Um, 
traditions within this country of depiction of, uh, of distress in the sea and, and of those in other countries. Uh, we looked at some, uh, for instance, some accident shots from uh, Holland, where. Well, I, as a benchmark, right, when it comes to taste, uh, you know, I've, I've worked on news desks before, and I've had reporters who've put too much salacious detail in a court copy, or there's imagery. And my answer to them is, right, well, okay, you take your copy, ring your grandmother, and read it aloud over the phone to them. Are you prepared to do that? And if they say no, I say, well, why are you going to land it on somebody's breakfast table? It's that kind of benchmark, and, and you know, if, if you, you, you've got to always remember who your audience is and whether it's acceptable. Really. So, uh, you have a question. Uh, how common are female war reporters, and is the approach the same to them as being in the military base? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I often get asked this question. Uh, with, uh, with the Iraq War of 2003, uh, Karen Allen from the BBC was embedded with us. Um, there are not so many female uh, war reporters, but there are probably more famous female re war reporters. You know, Murray Colvin and uh, Kate Aidy and pe people like that. Kate Aidy from Sutton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's no special treatment that, um, you know, like there's no ladies and gents toilet or anything like that. Uh, there, there are there are different toilets, but um, you know there are ordinary toilets and those people who are ill sort of thing. There's there's, there's that kind of segregation, but it is a case that um, you know, and that most women who I've known who have been involved in in this, uh, it is a case that they just get on with it. Whether the military vets it and says, well, I'm not having her because she's a woman or I'm not having him because he's from the Daily Mail or whatever. You know, I, I don't know that. But yes, there are opportunities, and I would not let gender be an issue to, to restrict you what you need to do this. So. Uh, would you say social media has uh, made it easier yeah. to report from uh, war zones? Or is there a you know, pressure to get things out without... You if know? you'll excuse the pun, it's an absolute minefield. One of the problems is, you see, Social media, uh, when when you're, it, it, it's an element for the, the guys pulling the big pic picture together. But when you are out in an embed, uh, often you can't use your mobile phone because instantly it, it sends a signal that highlights the position. Um, you know, if you were to tweet just going on patrol with the Royal Anglians in Sangin, you know, it's who's picking that up. So, so. The, the social media is an area where there are really tight restrictions within an embed and you, that's an issue. That if you go into an embed, you need to be <coughs> acutely aware of, you need to speak to the people about what sort of restrictions that there are in <coughs> because uh, it comes into this element of operational security. Um, and, and I mean, it's a while ago, but in 2003 I, I was, I was doing live interviews, really, with, you know, Radio Norfolk and Look East and people like that. Is that on that? Right? Is that on you, you may laugh, but, <laughs> but there are, there are. And, and, of course, you know, the, um, the guy sat in his armchair studio in Norwich was asking questions, and he would say, OK, so what are the RAF going to do today sort of thing? And you're live on air, and you have to say, Rather than say I can't possibly answer, you just have to talk around it. But but you, you have to be acutely w aware of the operational security element and social media. Uh, while there's all these sources coming out, it's more difficult for you to actually um, use it if you're in an embed situation for ba basically common sense, life, self-preservation reasons. Good question, very useful answer. Um, we'll, we'll have to be very quick. I think we've got other people want to come in. Yes. So whilst embedded, do you find the sort of same demand for quantity as journalists that you would have found perhaps whilst working in England? Um, well, it depends what is uh, available. Sometimes the stories that are just not there. And if you're a journalist and you're embedded and you're out there for five, six, seven days and you haven't filed the thing, you start to get really uptight about it. And I was embedded for six or seven weeks. Um, 
and probably filed about 50 stories and features during that time because there's lots of information. But actually, um, I went looking for it because I thought, I don't want to sit around doing anything all day. It's not just about justifying your existence. If it's not relevant, then don't, don't file it. But actually, there's all sorts of information that you can draw on and build, build up. And it doesn't, you're not probably using it for the next day or the next week. It's that a year's time, when you're doing a look-back analysis of something, you can draw on that. Or, in 15 years' time, you might find yourself before a group of third-year journalism students, and you might be wanting to talk about it. So, so all the experience that you get from these kind of scenarios, take them with you throughout your life, because you never quite know when they're when they going to drop in and be relevant. So, but what, one quick... Yeah, the, the thing is... When in, when in Iraq or there, you're three hours ahead, so your working window is not, not a 10 or 12 hour day, it's an 18 hour day or more, but that's just the way it is. I can just come on talk about this all day long, and I've actually got some questions which I won't be able to pause, but I'm going to a few questions. But um, uh, we're going to leave it there because for obvious reasons, you'll probably be aware that this is what we could do. Can you just. I'm hoping Mark's not been called back to do any more choosing.